Um, yes, it's wonderful to be here. It's um, such a great place. I don't know how many of you had a chance to see the exhibition that's been mounted in conjunction uh, with this Kwahi project. It's wonderful, and I'll be referring to um, one of the objects that's in, in the exhibition today. Um, it's also wonderful, and I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Anishinaabek and Algonquin territory. Um, the more I understand about my own family's history, the more I feel like my home territory is very large indeed, and so I went through it just on my way here on the train. Um, I think in many respects, in a city like Kingston, just like I experienced in a city like Montreal and sometimes also in a city like Ottawa, indigenous presence can be forgotten in these old cities. And there's, but the spirits are still there underneath all these layers of concrete and these very old, beautiful buildings. So in the spirit of those people who are still with us and that we're connected to, the three of us, um, I'd like to begin. A little more than a year ago, when the call went out for papers for this conference, I received this email from a colleague. I'm wondering if you've thought about what you will present at Kwahi. As much as anything, because the call for self-representation in women's art history before 1967 will make talking about indigenous women as early art makers very challenging. Happy to hear your thoughts on this. To which I replied, yeah, I've been scratching my head about this one. I'm not sure what I might squeeze into the call. The dates are tricky. The whole idea of self-portraiture is such a Western concept. I might have to sit this one out. A couple of days later, having had similar exchanges with other colleagues, I wrote Christina Hinault to share our concerns. I'm really stuck on how to hook up with this forthcoming Kwahi theme, I wrote. Self-portraiture as a genre and even understandings of the individual and self are so bound up in Western intellectual traditions that finding reasonable points of entry into concepts from the perspective of indigenous women is difficult. We've been subjects of portraiture, often with no control over how we've been represented. And looking at traditional art forms as self-portraiture is also tricky. It's important not to trivialize, simplify, misread or stretch just to achieve inclusion. At this point, I haven't submitted a paper as I'm simply drawing a blank. It doesn't feel, it, it feels like a closed door, I'm afraid, which I'm sure wasn't the planning committee's intent. At the same time, I was exchanging similar emails with the curators of the artist herself. My somewhat knee-jerk reaction was partly due to a fairly recent experience at that time, walking through an awkward iteration of the recent practice of inserting traditional artworks into the permanent Canadian collection at the National Gallery, which often works very well, but this particular time did not. A somewhat epic fail. Ins <laughs> inserting finely crafted functional objects made by indigenous women into a room full of paintings by white guys at that particular time period. Only exaggerated difference in privilege and diminished both the work and the artists. I was also concerned that including objects rather than faces in an exhibition of self-portraiture would create or could create a category of difference that would render indigenous women invisible further alienate us from the category of human and dislodge the artists from their art, as museum exhibition practice has done for so many years. Given the ongoing onslaught of gendered violence and racism, Indigenous women had had more than enough of that. Alicia Boutillier and Toby Bruce assured me that the exhibition would create space for dialogue and disruption and would push notions of self-portraiture and self-representation. They shared some of their exhibition planning with me, and I initially reluctantly conceded that I could probably think of a few possibilities, and I suggested a number. Particularly, I said, 
there are two wonderful little 18th century Cree dolls in the Cuming Museum in London, England that I thought could be considered portraits, if not self-portraits. We don't know who made these individual dolls, but they are storied objects who speak for both their makers and their subjects. It has often been said that there is no word for art in indigenous languages, but that isn't entirely true. There are entire vocabularies related to aesthetics and art making in both Neheoan and Anishinaabewin, Korean Ojibwe, and two Cree words are of interest here, and I apologize to any Cree speakers in the audience that I'm hoping there maybe aren't any so I can get away with this. And it's also maybe an indication of why we don't have a word for art, nice little three-letter word. Aoyakna, aspa cinema ikewen kakiskino amasosit, which translates as artistry, a noun. But it's really a compound verb. Algonquian languages in general are concerned with action and process, with verbs constituting about 80% of the total vocabulary. This emphasis on process can be seen in another word, nas papamu. And that translates as she, his, reproduces him, her, in her, his mind. And the reason for the she, he, his, her is because there are no gender pronouns in Algonquian languages. They're gender neutral. But since we are speaking of women here, naspapemu could be translated as she reproduces her in her mind, referring to the process of creating a portrait or a representation of a woman. <laughs> Prior to producing the portrait, one must first visualize. The form simply contains the mental image. In this case, the reproduction of her is the sculptural form of a doll. So I'd like to just give you a quick history of the women who made these dolls. Hudson Bay Company. So here's the little blurry map where you see the stars. These are early Hudson's Bay Company posts in Cree territory. Established by charter 1670, given monopoly to trade on all lands trading into Hudson Bay. They had no idea how big a territory that was at the time. Uh, established uh, trading posts along the shores of Hudson Bay, 1679 Albany, 1697 York Factory, and 1717 Fort Prince of Wales. We tend to think of the north as this kind of untouched frontier, but in fact, the north, the far north, is the first kind of line of contact. And these forts were um, pretty large establishments. The London committee that managed the Hudson's Bay Company had strict policies uh, about women because it didn't take long for British men to discover Cree women and vice versa. We have been much prejudiced by the entertaining of Indian women in our forts and factories, for thereby our servants have not only been debauched, but our goods and provisions have been extravagantly spent, wherefore in the next place we do absolutely prohibit you to permit any such familiarities as formerly have been and suffer no woman to be entertained or admitted into our forts or our houses under penalty of forfeiture of their wages. You can almost hear the administrative foot stomp. And Andrew Graham, who upon his retirement wrote, the company permits no European women to be brought within their territories and forbid any natives to be harbored in the settlements. This latter has never been obeyed. So these are the dolls that were collected from Hudson Bay Territory around 1780, um, possibly earlier. They have traveled from their home to one of the oldest museums in England sold at auction when that museum closed. And they've been in three museums in London. In this photograph, they are lying on my sketchbook. The doll and the artist herself is among seven surviving Cree, likely Omishkegawak dolls in private and museum collections. Three in the United Kingdom, four in private American collections. 
representing and made by Cree women, they are very old, having traveled from the hands of their unknown creators on Hudson Bay to a collector, friend, or family member in England, moving from this home to one museum after another. They are also hybrid objects. They are either imported 18th century Queen Anne dolls dressed in Omishkigua clothing, or as, or as the bodies, arms, and legs seem rustic compared to other Queen Anne dolls, it may have been only the heads that were imported, either for trade or sent by families, friends, or provided by a collector. The hair also seems constructed differently from other Queen Anne dolls, and may have been gathered, twined, and carefully stitched by women on Hudson's Bay, perhaps carrying the DNA of the artist herself or her family members. Connecting these dolls to each other, journal descriptions of women's dress, and an 18th century drawing by Samuel Hearn gives visual form to text and memory. James Isham, writing from York Factory in 1743, offered the most complete, if somewhat incomprehensive, uh, comprehensible description of the ancient apparel of Cree women. They take about one and a half yards of cloth, which is to be sewed up the side to the armpits. There is four strings, which ties over the shoulders and serves them for smock, ground, and petticoat, having no other garment but a coat of skins flying over loose, which becomes them very well, with stockings of the same stuff, which reaches halfway their thigh and ties to the said string round their waist with their garters tied below the knee. Their shoes are made of deerskin dressed and socks of green rabbit skin with the pelt next the skin. They also have sleeves of leather or cloth from the wrist to the shoulder, which they also tie together with strings before and behind. Now, imagine how glad I was when I actually found these dolls and got some kind of visual representation of what that description might possibly look like. And a cap, a piece of cloth which they sew behind and reaches over their shoulders. All these garments are worked full of beads, porcupine quills, and other ornaments which they deck themselves out with. The surviving dolls all wear variations of these garments. The Cuming dolls are earlier. They were in London's Laverian Museum collection by the late 18th century. One doll wears a hide strap dress with quill work embellished breast cover and detachable sleeves. Elaborate quill work hair ties cover her braids and she holds a tiny purse. The other wears a side fold dress, painted robe and a trade cloth hood, the cap which reaches over the shoulder described by Isham and a tippet by other observers. Samuel Hearn's 1777 drawing of Fort Prince of Wales, which is just outside of present day Churchill, shows a tiny but elegant couple strolling outside the palisades of the fort. The woman wears a long hide dress, hood, and robe with, ornamented with painted designs and, we can assume, trimmed with quill work exactly like the clothing worn by the dolls. The dolls themselves are a record of artistic materials, techniques, and aesthetics. We see complete ensembles made of similar elements, yet each doll is individual. The virtuosity of the tiny stitches, the variety of quill work techniques, just on these tiny dolls, there is netting, folding, weaving, and wrapping, and a tiny edge stitch. And the scale which they are executed speak to the confidence and skill of a master artist. They also speak to the relationship between art making and identity, the stitch as an act of self. Created in complex social and economic settings by women residing at or near Hudson's Bay Company trading posts, they speak to the busy hands of women whose actions integrated disparate knowledge systems in their creative work as they did in other aspects of their domestic sphere. Descriptions of these women and generations of their daughter consistently note their creative production, as when John Franklin described the half-breed women observed during his northern travels between 1819 and 1822. The principal occupation of these women, exclusive of attention to their children, of whom they are very fond, seems to be dressing skins, sewing and garnishing leather with porcupine quills for shoes or parts of dress. And in this work, they display great taste and ingenuity and no small skill in extracting the proper color from different materials to stain their quills. 
So, and my hat's off to anyone who could look at a porcupine and think, oh, art, of course. <laughs> The dolls are encoded with story and science. The secrets of the dyes, still vibrant after more than 200 years, attracted the attention of the Royal Society, and samples of their work, raw materials, and recipes crossed the ocean. The results of an unsuccessful experiment were published in the Philosophical Transactions in 1772. But these dolls remember. The doll featured in the artist herself embodies a later description of the women of York Factory. In 1812, Thomas McKeever observed the impact of new ideas on social practices and clothing. Women at York Factory had embraced the notion that Sunday was a special day and dressed accordingly. McKeever describes, on Sunday, in place of the blanket, they wear a piece of green or scarlet cloth made into the form of a mantle and thrown carelessly over the shoulders. It is in general very handsomely embroidered with various ribbons, particularly green and yellow. Under this they wear a cloth dress, not unlike a European riding habit. When going abroad they wear a black beaver hat ornamented with feathers and bands of various colored ribbons. On the entire, an Indian woman in her Sunday dress is, has a very pretty and interesting appearance. The garments are made to move. The long fringe is either wrapped in quill work or beaded. Each female doll wears a wide loom quill work belt with a long fringe encircling her waist. It would have swayed with each step. The fine cloth and ribbon Sunday best worn by the ladies of York Factory also illustrate the importance of access to trade goods and inventiveness. Creativity, play, and experimentation combine new and old elements of fashion. Yet, the elements of clothing remain similar. Although the cuming dolls are almost entirely clothed in indigenous materials, this later doll is clothed entirely in trade goods, fine wool and broadcloth, fabric tape, and beads. So this is, when you see her in the show, she's wearing her robe, but this is what's underneath. And one of the things that struck me, so this is two views of her from the front, is these large beaded rosettes are absolutely en vogue right now with indigenous hip hop artists. So we, it's just struck me when I saw that how long we've been wearing these large beaded rosettes. So in here the quill work is judiciously applied. It's on the uh, quill work uh, fringe around her belt and also um, a little bit on her hair ties, but everything else is trade goods. But when you compare them, they're virtually in, in identical. The hoods are virtually identical, as are the hair ties. The porcupine quill belt and quill wrap fringe are exactly the same. So one of the things that it shows is it shows innovation and experimentation, but it also shows continuity, because the media has changed, but the form is almost exactly the same. The only doll that can be attributed to a known artist is a later doll who's seen some pretty hard times by the looks of him, is a little doll dressed in men's clothing that was made by uh, Phoebe Sinclair Bunn, the daughter of fur trader William Sinclair from the Orkney Islands and his Cree wife Nahoe. She was, who was born in the vicinity of York Factory and Phoebe herself grew up in York Factory in Norway House. The doll was sent to English friends of her husband who later gave it to the Horniman Museum along with other examples of Phoebe Sinclair Bunn's work. Correspondence between the two families indicate an annual exchange with the Bunn family send, sending Phoebe's moccasins, birch bark baskets, model snowshoes and dolls, and, the, and receiving British print material from the Baileys in turn. The quality of the doll head, the painted face, the lack of glass eyes, and, the, uh, and not having the outline of fine dots uh, in the other dolls indicates both a lesser quality and possibly a later date, which suggests that this little fellow is likely dressed in memories of clothing worn during Phoebe's childhood at York Factory. It's inter interesting to speculate 
If this small group of dolls came from one family, Phoebe, Nahoe Sinclair, possibly other daughters, or the larger community of fashionable women living in the big stone forts on the western shores of Hudson Bay. This is sort of connecting to other research that I'm doing on the notion of York Factory as fashion center, because daughters from York Factory then moved all over the place, particularly to the Red River Settlement. So I love these dolls. I love this doll. She has such presence when you see her in her case. And she tells such an incredible story. Having only seen photographs, the private collector is very generous. He's toured his private collection. He sent me years ago um, photographs. But having only seen them in photographs and then seeing them in real, as my kids used to say, I'm, I'm struck with the potential age of this doll, which makes her even more precious. And just that her stitches really connect me to my own ancestors. I have ancestors from all over the place, because uh, I also have ancestors from James Bay and Hudson Bay. And I can imagine my own ancestors sashaying around the post, dressed to the nines, or at least I hope that's how they were. In closing, I would like to thank Christina for creating space here on the first day of Kwahi for us to discuss the limits of inclusion and share our thoughts on early self-representation by Indigenous women artists. But I would most particularly like to thank Alicia and Toby, who pursued every lead I suggested, come that close to getting the little cuming dolls, and when those negotiations fell through, successfully borrowed this tiny woman and her surprisingly large baby from a private collector. These dolls are more than portraits. They are tiny archives and visual history. They are visual evidence of why they earned the inarticulate but sincere admiration of the men who attempted to describe them. Giche miigwech to the curators, to listening for your efforts to bring them home for a visit and for, showing and for showing and sharing your progress and enthusiasm with me throughout the process. This will provide so many with the opportunity to see these rare and precious little beings who take their place among the other beautiful and diverse works in the exhibition which speaks for and about the women who created them. I'm not sure what the exhibition schedule is, but if they're coming anywhere near Manitoba, I'm going to do, are they, how, are they going west at all? Oh, crap. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk to Fox Lake, because uh, the women of York Factory, the First Nations people who lived at York Factory, were removed from York Factory at one point, and they live in three different First Nations in Manitoba. My first teaching gig was with Fox Lake First Nation, who are very, have very vivid recollections of their time at York Factory. And Kevin Brownlee has worked with an elder from South Indian Lake who's also connected. And they, he just did a children's book uh, based on the archaeological findings of a woman's um, grave, which shows traces of these garments even earlier from the 15th, 1500s. So there's a real interest among the, the Cree of this region to reconnect with these beautiful ladies. So I'm going to let them know. They mainly take kids all over the place. You never know. Okay. Thank you.